And you have a guy coming back under some probably controversial circumstances. You know, it's Black History Month. <laughs> this is the cultural dinner. And I can only imagine when my name was tossed into the running. You want to bring a convicted felon to sit with us during Black History Month for our cultural dinner? Yeah, that, that stigma sort of follows me around, you know. That's my, my scarlet letter. Uh, one that I don't necessarily wear with pride, but one that I can't escape. Uh, and that, that's a part of my history. But it doesn't define me. Uh, so here we are. I, I have to warn you, my, my roots are in hip hop. So you might hear a rap or two this evening. So if anyone hates rap music, <laughs> I'm not asking you to leave. I'm just warning you. You can stomach this performance because it's not offensive. But uh, I think you might, uh, you might be pleasantly surprised, I hope. me now and then do you think about me now and then yeah yeah well, i'm coming home again being home again. the name is apparent the voice precedes this for seven plus years i walked wilderness reminisced on better days like jay's how real is this when i ain't even think i was missed i learned to get with my hands to do better like dude you knew better Life is fast moving, how quick could you get up? This is fit form, calisthenics and bid poems. 20 on the bar, that's money, the kids home. Improve the chess form, letters, books, and domes. I'm every piece on the board, from the rooks to pawns. I bear witness to the mind fitness. I supersede existence. True indeed, we often need resistance. Dreams crashing, falls are broken when your team has them. I stop smoking to redeem fashion as the aura revolve. Some puzzles won't be solved at all. I had a dream at an inaugural ball. You know John, soft-spoken. Brooklyn kept my heart open. I sing the song till every string on this guitar is broken. A man amidst the masses, the lone one in the crowd. I took a vow, this homecoming is ours. I travel miles from the south to the east. I learned to stand on my feet all the while from the mouth of the beast. And that's the least of it. The comrades who's still in it, you will be remembered, loved, and represented. Love. Do you think about me now and then? Do you think about me now and then? Yeah, yeah. Coming home again, me and home again. Do you think about me now and then? Do you think about me now and then? Yeah, yeah. It looks like I'm home again. Thanks. So I can't take the credit for that song. That's a song originally done by uh, Kanye West and, and Chris Martin from Coldplay. The circumstances of that song uh, are interesting, only insofar as it was the first uh, song that I recorded and shot a video for and released digitally uh, after my release from federal prison. And I called up a friend of mine, a childhood friend, Talib Kweli, some of you may, may know him, and I said, hey, I want to I want to do a song. I want to let people know where I am mentally uh, because there might be an expectation. You've been away for some time. What are you doing? What are you talking about? Where is your head? So we went in and I wanted people to know that, yeah, I'm, I'm still rapping. You know, I, I, I still got it. Although the content of, of the rap uh, is a lot different, admittedly, than it was eight years ago before life shifted and, uh, and the earth moved beneath my feet and I saw a, a side of, of living that I never thought I would. So I'm from Brownsville, Brooklyn, originally, uh, single parent at home. I have a terrific, wonderful, um, supportive mother, Flo. Her name is tattooed on my wrist here. And she's tiny, but she's a, she's a firecracker. And, uh, and through it all, 
through my ups and through my downs, she never stopped believing in me. And, uh, and that was very, very encouraging because there were times when I stopped believing in myself, when I had given up on myself. If someone calls you a name for so long, well, it's only a matter of time before you start to call yourself that name. And, uh, and if, if people are trained, if you will, to put you in your place, well, unless uh, you've got an incredible support system, and I was lucky to, uh, you might be more susceptible to resigning yourself to that lower place than not. But I didn't just rap while I was away. I, uh, I learned how to play the guitar during my time in prison. If not very well, like, like very, very accomplished musicians who, uh, who preceded me, at least well enough to support myself. Ironically enough, I was able to find a liberty in supporting myself uh, that I didn't have prior to going away because I was always dependent upon a band or a DJ to back me up. Nowadays, it's like have guitar, will travel, and, uh, <laughs> and I'll be able to sit and have an intimate experience with 300 people at a university beneath a glaring spotlight. I'm going to sing a tune now called Life Has Just Begun. There's a video for it on, uh, on YouTube chronicling my first day out. Literally, they had a film crew in the parking lot. And, uh, and it was so dramatic. Uh, I don't know, for good reason. It, it felt like a dramatic day. It actually still does pr feel pretty dramatic. <laughs> Phases of childhood and adolescent mazes As I look back, all those nights and the days have faded To something called halcyon Tomorrow might just be never Instead of the trap of all or nothing endeavors We'll stand on the square We'll breathe good air, cause here is where life has just begun. We'll stand on the square, we will breathe good air, cause here is where life has just begun. The square, the square, we'll stand on the square, eh, 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 yeah. Smiles don't win And the sun only shines now and then It often rains here Amongst friends And so I lean Up against what you say and me There's a reason to it That's why I came here I've been sent The plan comes together I know my mans are fed up with playing parts We dealing ones are better And you get played in the sinking 
This ain't about some bar drinking buffoon. This is the age of thinking. This is fine tuning. Check one, bring the goons in. I'm new, improved off the bid like cocooning. So meet the newest author. The larger picture is ill. Let's keep it real. Better still, what do you offer? Ain't no pretending it. Furthermore, I'm more mature. I don't fear to leave you here, that's what the earth is for The superficial's a given, I know the surface more I left the pages of the sermon on the church's floor For those who get a date, I hope you did it great I say a prayer that all my dudes don't recidivate Though we legitimate the complex, we gotta wake up one day I advise your alarm is set most sincere, you might like it there That's what your hand called for, doing life in there I know some shorty's shaking out, looking nice in there do you ever wonder why there's no lights in there? This ain't a movie, miss. Could you do me this? Little favor just for you, I'm an enthusiast. And should we fall, let's get back on track. Walk with me, this is food for thought. You can snack on that. In space to float. From here I see the coast. Would you be there in my love if I need you? You most, most, but I'll give you me where fantastic truths hold sway, and every fool is king for every day. They know your name here, it's in print. I'm still addicted to the urban era, like counterfeit bond bearers and turban wearers. Indeed, I vacate and laid in Rivieras, but please don't compare me to the non-living. I swear one look at my face, you'd say, there's moms in them. It's a war going on outside, in my opinion. Hear me well, minions, it's an end to every sentence. I crown who this is round to back for business, the bear monster. Better thinking with my hair longer, more pedantic with my sights on the North Atlantic. How you take the devil off the planet? This game with no advantage, you're trapped in substandard. Granted, you eat what you fed, including your language. Stuck in your position, feeling helpless to change it. I don't vie for position, I just jockey the lanes. You expect me to see war and sing this the same? Who watched the rich get richer like Monopoly change? While the poor got poor in the property game. I know your thoughts, better still what you're probably saying. A few years in exile, and he's probably the same. A few years in exile, and you're like John so foul, he went away. So what do you think, he conscious now? I'm a mold of my breed, this ode to Kuali. See live what you told me, I ride with you, homie, now. In space to flow. From here I see the coast. Would you be there in my love if I need you most, most? I'll give you me. I'll give you me I'll give you me I'll give you me Somebody asked me recently is it John, who's your audience? I said, what do you mean? He said, what does your audience look like? Well, what do you mean? When you perform and you're on stage and you look out into the, the crowd, what, what does your audience look like? I said, I've, I've never really thought of it that way. Well, not, not recently, because my audience, you never know what they look like. So, and this was an interviewer from some magazine or some television show or, show or some journal. He said, but every artist has an audience. I said, oh, well, there's no denying it. I have an audience. But my audience, it, it's not about what they look like. But there is, a, there is a, definitely a, a character to my audience. Are they hardcore hip-hop enthusiasts? Some of them. Or are they finance guys? Some of them. I'd like to think that my audience is a is a critical audience. I know that the people who have shown up recently and the people who continue to show up are people who don't necessarily take what I say on face value. I think I'd be insulted if they did. But 
they embraced that, that, that philosophy of questioning everything, which is why I couldn't think of a better audience than a university audience where after so many years of, of learning by rote, you're finally encouraged to question everything and everyone, including your professors, including your primary sources of information, which have kind of dissipated in the face of Google. Um, <laughs> but now keep in mind, things like Google and the iPhone and the Blackberry, uh, Twitter, Facebook, these things were theoretical notions for me because I read about them while I was away. <gasps> Is there a baby here? Wow, you guys accept them young. <laughs> That's a, one smart kid. And critically challenging me. That's what he's doing right now. I don't believe you. <laughs> Not liking what I have to say. So, from Brownsville, Brooklyn, learning how to play the violin as an introduction to music, and then being from the culture of listening to the radio. And I know that many people don't listen. Well, a lot of people don't listen to the radio anymore, not like they used to. But we were, we were beholden to the radio. And as soon as one commercial came on, we flipped through the station in order to find another song. This was before hip hop or, or R&B had its dedicated format. So we listened to everything. We listened to Bruce Springsteen. We listened to Madonna. We listened to uh, Bizet. We just listened for good songs. So it was a great introduction for me because, excuse me, as hip hop emerged, I didn't harbor prejudices to music. I realized very early on that a good song is a good song is a good song, irrespective of the so-called genre. But you know, we as humans, we like to categorize things. We like to compartmentalize. We like to say, this is its box, and now I'm happy because we've defined it. Well, as fate would have it, I think that we've come full circle with our short attention spans, with all due respect. We are listening to more different types of uh, music than ever, and I'm really, really inspired by, by what I'm seeing. But it's a challenge for me to actually make a song that would have someone listen to it in its entirety, rather than just the first verse and the chorus before something else pops into mind and they, and they zip on to something else. So that's my challenge, and uh, I'm, I'm going to do my best. I, uh, I respect school because I, I wasn't challenged uh, by the material as much as I was by the, the people who instructed me. The material was easy, memorizing facts and figures, but it, it was... Uh, it, it was the, the occasional mentor that I met who encouraged me to think outside of the box, to not just take the facts and the figures, but to connect the dots, to find my interpretation of certain situations, to triangulate the information, if you will, to come to a truth that might not be either widely reported or even believed, but to discover my personal truths. So I did well academically, uh, and that landed me a full scholarship to a prep school in New England called Phillips Exeter Academy. So from Brownsville, Brooklyn, here I was, a little tough kid, know-it-all, going to live in New Hampshire for four years. And it freaked me out. I'm walking down the paths, and people are looking at me, but not snarling. They're saying, hello. You know me? No, hi, how are you? Oh. You know, that sort of defensiveness that, that came with Brownsville, Brooklyn, and having your little ditty bop was uh, was challenged with kindness. So somebody who didn't know me walked by me and greeted me. It was something I wasn't used to. And the classes were smaller. We were taught uh, with something called the Harkness system, where we sat around a round or an, an ovular table, um, and we looked at our interlocutors, as opposed to sitting in a classroom setting where somebody can be protected by one's back. No, if I had an opinion, I'm going to look at you in the eyes and I'm going to tell you my opinion. I couldn't hide behind a, a book or, I don't know, the rear anatomy, if you will, I don't know. So that was an interesting lesson unto itself. And I did pretty well in Exeter, you know. It was an adjustment, but life is an adjustment, I guess. 
And then I had the opportunity to go to college. So I went to NYU for about two weeks. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Well, I went to classes for about two weeks, but I lived in the dorms for about two months after. <laughs> the food was delicious. <laughs> but I was back home. I was knee deep in New York. I'd, I'd returned. The prodigal son from boarding school had returned. And I was, I was just in love with, with, with the city. You know, it was alive with life, and, and I wanted to be a part of it. Well, the universe has a funny way of giving you what you want when you want it. Because an opportunity presented itself for me to enter into the music business, which is something that I'd wanted to do for so many years. But not as an artist, per se. Uh, a small record company called Baracus Entertainment invited me to be their director of A&R. Artist and repertoire to the baby in the back. So what's A&R? So it was my job at the tender age of 19 to fly around the country and to find new talent, to uh, offer them record deals and to bring them back to New York, develop them, and hopefully turn them into major successes, which was bittersweet for me because well, I wanted to be one of those artists. But I accepted my fate and I said, all right, I'm gonna go don a suit and tie and go find some, some talent. Of course, surreptitiously, when the talent left the studio, I'd sit there at the sampler, making beats and things and songs for myself. Uh, because I guess there was a part of me that still harbored the notion that one day I might be able to, uh, to sing my own tune. This is one of the first songs that I wrote on, a, on this instrument. How can I not face you were? When you are smaller than I am And the greatness I've become How can I not face you first When you are larger than I am And the smile I hide behind The sky is falling all around me As I stand inside of nowhere Thinking life ain't fair But at least it's mine The sky Falling all around me Like warm summer rain How could something so cruel feel so How can I not face you world When the good you've given me It outweighs the bad each time Sometimes How can I not face you world When you've shown me home exists Even when it's not at my fingertips Falling all around me As I stand inside of nowhere Thinking life ain't fair But at least it's mine The sky is falling all around me Like warm summer rain How could something so cruel feel so How can I not face you world? How can I not face you world? Can I not face you? Girl? How can I not face you, girl? So I get an invitation one day to come to the supper club in New York. Uh, in order to meet the next biggest, greatest thing in the musical world. I said, who is the next biggest, greatest thing in the musical world? Look, two guys and a girl. I have, I have the videotape. I'm dating myself because we actually had a, he had a VHS cassette tape. You know nothing about this. What is a videotape? <laughs> <laughs> People looking for like their translator mechanisms. Wait, wait, let's look that up. Let's Google that. So <laughs> he played a video, uh, moving pictures, digital imagery. Uh, and the group was called the Fugees. And the song was Booth Bath. So I said to myself, this is pretty interesting, you know. 
two guys rapping and a girl rapping and, and the girl's really good. So he said, no, you got to come to the supper club tonight and see these guys. I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm not in the studio. I'll stop by. I show up and I'm blown away. Literally, I'm in the back and, and, and I can't stop bobbing my head. Not literally that I was blown away. Okay? To all you literal users out there. I was literally in the back bobbing my head. Uncontrollably. Literally. So after the show, I had the opportunity to meet the girl in the group, Lauren Hill. And there's a press line waiting to speak to her and any number of fans, people who are getting the buzz on, on this group. And we sat and stood there in a stairwell speaking for about 15 minutes. We knew instantly that, that we were just you know, destined to be best friends. And perhaps romantic interests, albeit briefly. In the interest of total disclosure, this is academia. I realize that you guys are going to be critical of what I say. So we dated for like a, a smidgen of time. Doesn't matter. <laughs> or does it? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> so by the time they were getting ready to work on the second album, Lauren said, John, you have to come to New Jersey and play us some of the music that you've been working on. For what? I'm a businessman now. I don't want to be an artist. She says, John, seriously? Like, you make beats every single night. You write raps. You call me while I'm in Hawaii on tour talking about, Lauren, can you please listen to this new rap? So I said, all right, I'll come to New Jersey. She twisted my arm. Went to New Jersey, sat with Praz and Clef and, and, and Lauren and Jerry. And this was, it, the name of the studio, embarrassingly enough, was called The Booger Basement. I don't know why it was called The Booger Basement, but it was definitely in a basement and it was tight, and there were a lot of us in there with really big speakers. And I don't know why the neighborhood just didn't complain, but I guess, you know, maybe we were the hope of the neighborhood, so they let us play music really loudly. So I played songs for them, but I said, well, if you like this, perhaps you want to say a rap on it like this. So they said, oh, you rap too. But you have to be on this song, then you can't just produce it. But I'm a businessman. I don't, I don't rap. I'm just saying this is, I'm just instructing you. All right, all right, I'll rap. I'll rap. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that album was called The Score. And it became the biggest thing in hip hop history. But we knew it. Like, we, we, well, well we, knew, we knew two things would happen. We knew that this album would either flop because it was so out of the box, or it would just be a huge success. Well, thank goodness it was the latter, and uh, propelled in large part to a cover of a song called Killing Me Softly that, uh, that, that Lauren did a Roberta Flack original song. Um, but that album changed my life. I went back to the record company and I said, well guys, thanks for the opportunity to work here, but..." I really want to go on tour. What? But you're a businessman. I know. But I'm also an artist. It's like, you know, I, I, I like, yeah, I revealed myself. <gasps> and they gave me their blessings. They said, John, if this thing doesn't work out, you've got, uh, you've got an open door. You can come back. And the great thing for them is they went on, in my absence, to become the most <laughs> credible underground hip hop label of, of the era. Um, signing groups like uh, Most Deaf and, and Talib Kweli in their former incarnation of Bla uh, as Black Star, which was amazing. So here we, we were, you know, we were young adults on world tours, achieving greatness, you know, success and, and wealth. And I'd, <laughs> I'd gone from sort of being unwanted or, you're, you're so cute, you're such a good friend, to you know, being wanted, and that was interesting for me. You know, kind of show up to award shows now with arm candy. I was like, oh, I've made it, you know. That was, <laughs> I was validated at that point. But there was something interesting going on. You know, we were performing in front of, in fact, I, I'll, I'll tell you this, there were two, there were two very large shows, one in Italy and one in Haiti. 
and they were the largest, they were the largest crowds I'd ever seen, 500,000 uh, each, at each venue for very different reasons. One was the San Remo fes uh, Festival in Italy, and the other was because Wyclef had finally come home in Haiti, and he, Wyclef could have run for president back then. He and still can, obviously, now. You know, but he was there. He was their son, and it was just amazing to have that opportunity. And something had happened. Um, we were on a jet, and I was dating some luminary. And we weren't on a plane. Like, we were flying private, going from one venue to the next. And I just had, I guess, this, this awful look on my face. And, and my best friend, D said to me, he said, John, what's, what's wrong? You know, as he sips from his flute of champagne, what's, what's wrong? I said, I don't know, man. I just, I just feel like I'm missing something. I feel empty. He's like, yeah, have some more champagne. <laughs> you know, it was one of those things. Performing in front of a half million people and feeling empty. And it was something that I had to question. Uh, meeting the who's who of the times. And then finally being given the opportunity to be my own artist because I'd uh, acquired a, a bit of a buzz on my own where people knew my name. I'd go to restaurants, I'd go to clubs, and hey, that's, that's John Forte, come on in, we got a table for you. So Sony said, are you ready? This is, this is your shot, you know? We just sold 15 million with the Fugees, we just sold four million with Wyclef, now it's your turn. I'm like, yeah, it's my turn. I'm gonna do it big. And I came out with my solo album in 1998 called Poli Sci. This is, a, this is a college, a university, political science. I thought I was being you know, tongue in cheek because it was P O L Y hyphen S C I, you know, the many sciences. I was mixing the street life with academia. I was being the wise kid, you know. <laughs> I guess too wise because it came out and it had only, uh, we, we flopped. It sold about 100,000 units, which by today's standards would be a huge success. But back then, it was a commercial disappointment. How do you go from selling millions and millions and millions of, re of, of records, songs, albums, to only selling 100,000? Sony called me in. What happened? You're asking me what happened? You guys dropped the ball. You guys are incompetent. You don't know what you're doing. You know. And I'm in the boardroom screaming at the executives at Sony Music. So they sat back and, uh-huh, yeah, you're right. You don't think? OK, you're right. And now you're dropped. What? Yeah, this is no longer your home. You can, you can look for a new home. Well, fine. Don't you know who I am? I'm John Forte. And I was really feeling myself. So I uh, walked out, 550 Madison, the revolving doors, you know, it was something out of a movie. <laughs> Wind blowing, my little hair blowing with it. What am I gonna do now? Because then it hit me like a ton of bricks. I had no money. I'd blown through all the money that I earned in anticipation of this album being a success. So I said, what am I gonna do? Ah, the universe heard me. And what did she do? She introduced me to a fella who knew that I was looking for a way to fund this new album. And uh, he was looking for someone like me. And what was someone like me? Someone who knew a lot of people who was connected. Uh, and I involved myself in his criminal enterprise. Well, why didn't I ask my friends and family for help, for money, for advice even? I was too proud. I was too arrogant. I shot up like a rocket, you know, stratospheric, Icarus-like, and uh, refused to look back, refused to take, uh, to take anyone's advice, thinking that I knew, I knew it best. So what did I do? I uh, invited young women in particular, because that's what he wanted, to act as couriers to move his merchandise, uh, money, drugs, from point A to point B on his behalf. And I'm thinking to myself, if the house of cards ever falls, I'm good, because everyone knows me. I'm, I'm just a musician. All I did was set up the introductions. I'm not knee deep in this. I don't really know the inner workings of the operation. And what I don't know, I'm certainly not going to ask. I'm just going to look the other way. So that was my 
That was my profound logic. Yeah, I'm, I'm a musician. I'm a rapper, you know. I'm, I'm no drug dealer. Hmm. So when that House of Cards fell in 2000, and I went to trial in 2001, the, ju the judge and the jury weren't as willing to accept, I'm just a rapper, as my defense. So in 2001, I was sentenced to 168 months in a federal prison, 14 years, for my involvement in that criminal enterprise. I'm in a federal prison. September the 6th, 2001. I'm in a federal prison in Houston, Texas. September the 6th, 2001. In a state of shock. Five days later, September the 11th, 2001. Here I am, miles away from home, in a federal prison, in my bunk. Someone knocks on the door. Yeah. Hey, homie, you better come and watch the TV. Nah, that's cool. I don't, I don't watch TV, brother. You better. New York is on fire. New, what? I got up. I borrowed someone's radio because you have to listen through a, a transistor radio for the, uh, for the television. And I looked and I saw just after the first plane hit, and then the second plane hit. And I rushed to the phone. And I couldn't get through. I couldn't call anyone. Because all the phone lines were busy. So you talk about nothing beneath my feet. Having just gotten, uh, or, or just having just been found guilty. And then this happening to New York. And of course, we, we didn't know how it would play out. I had reached the end of the world as far as, I, as far as I was concerned.
just so you know, again, just in, in, full inter in the interest of full disclosure, I'm actually just looking at a list of songs and letting the story kind of tell itself. I don't really have an outline, and I wanted to do an outline, but that seems a bit calculated. And I think that, well, I owe you uh, your own narrative rather than something that was just you know, prepared for the crowd. So you will leave here knowing that this was your narrative. The facts don't change. Don't think that, but he told us at Illinois State University that this is what happened and he told Montana that, no. no the facts remain the same, but the vibe, uh, what we're doing is, is uniquely yours. So what do you do with a 14-year prison sentence? Having come to the joint with a quasi-celebrity, because people knew who I was, from the corrections officers to the inmates. And I wasn't always well received. Inmates were actually very, very forgiving. Inmates generally are very forgiving, ironically enough. But corrections officers, they weren't as forgiving. In fact, as I'm being, you know, doing my job one day as an orderly, I'm on my knees, I'm taking the trash can, uh, well, I'm, I'm cleaning out the trash can, uh, and the CO comes in. So what does it feel like? I said, what? Going from the top of the world to cleaning out trash. I said, I'm just doing my job, sir. I'm just doing my job. And I thought back to the Canterbury Tales. <laughs> and I thought, well, there were many people with roles and jobs in the Canterbury Tales. But the one person who had the purest heart was the person who shoveled beep out of the stalls day in and day out. Uh, our professors are cringing. Did he just say shoveled beep? I'm censoring. Um, but true enough. That was one of the most humbling experiences for me because I didn't feel as if I, if I was being disingenuous. I felt that I was just doing my job. One might say, oh, it was a stoic approach. No, it, it wasn't. I was hyper cognizant of where I was and what I was doing and, and what had happened to me. But a couple of things could have happened. I could have just rejected the notion and lived in denial that I'd wound up here, this amazing roller coaster ride of events, and finally wound up here. Or I could accept that for what it was. Not resign myself to my fate, per se, but move beyond that. Instead of, instead of uh, 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 saying, you know, I'm just number 888-400-079, Ah, uh, you know what, I was, I was something before I came in here. I wasn't necessarily the nicest guy. I wasn't the brightest guy. But I was loved. And that speaks for something. And I hadn't burned my bridges, per se, because I had family, I had friends, I had people who supported me. I had people who'd forgiven me long before I learned how to forgive myself. And when I was at my lowest, here comes the universe. You know, it'd be a Tuesday, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, I lost it all, everything. And then I'd go to mail call, and I'd get, you know, a newspaper, a magazine, and a postcard from Japan. I'm like, who do I know in Japan? Well, and and uh, I'd say a sort of broken English. Someone had written on the postcard, you know, thank you for this song. My wife and I were married to it, and we listened to it, you know, on every anniversary, and we just want to thank you for giving us that music. So just when I'm like, you know, at my nadir, here comes something to, to prop me up. So there was no consistency during the time of, 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 of emotion. There, it was not a flat line of emotion. Some days were better than others. That's, you know, that's how I answer when people ask, well, how was it? Some days are better than others.